Five. More than halfway there. Is everyone tired? How are we feeling? Good? <laughs> so we are uh, most of the way there. Tonight is a really exciting night. So we're going to be talking about SWAT and we're going to be talking about just marketing in general as well. Uh, so you, you guys are lucky enough that uh, I get to talk to you about a SWOT analysis. So we're going to go through that real quick, talk about what a SWOT analysis is, how you use it, when it's useful, um, and ways to use it properly as well. And then we're going to go on to our, our second presentation. And uh, we have Brian and Trent joining us today and they're over on the, the left hand side here. Your guys is right. And I'm really excited. Um, I sent you guys a little bit of info about them today. Um, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, you, you guys kind of know how I prefer to work. I like to let my speakers speak for themselves. Uh, but just let me say, in terms of marketing, these are two gentlemen who know and understand what marketing is. And these are the type of guys that if I had questions in terms of marketing for a client, I would try to call them. So I highly encourage you guys to, if you have questions, try and stump them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if that would be possible. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ryan especially said he wanted really hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the guy dressed up. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we're just going to go through uh, some basic housekeeping, talking about last week, kind of like we always do. I'm going to give a quick presentation on the SWOT analysis. We're going to go into a really quick break after that, and then we're going to be talking to, uh, to Trent and Brian as well. Um, tonight there's a chance that we're going to finish early as well, which I'm sure some of you... Uh, We'll smile at. I used to have a professor, and every time that we finished early, he would say, I'm giving you back the greatest gift I can, time. Uh, and <laughs> as an entrepreneur, it's kind of true, because there's only so many hours in a day. Uh, and then we're going to go on to the conclusion as well. So let's uh, talk a little bit about last session. We had, uh, in my mind, a couple of great presentations last week. We talked about human resources. We talked about market research. Uh, is there anyone that had a specific takeaway that they really liked from last week, or any questions about last week? Not particularly, that's fair. I'll, I always have a couple points that I like to share. Um, for those of you that are following me uh, and sh the CEC on Twitter, you'll see that I posted a story about Subway. Um, and I kind of wanted to bring that up this session uh, to talk a little bit about marketing. For those of you that didn't hear what happened, Subway actually got in a lot of trouble. I believe it was in an Australian court where they got sued because their footlongs weren't actually 12 inches long. And it all started with a Twitter picture that a teenager took of a tape measure next to a foot long sub and it clearly showed the sub was only 11 inches and subway actually got in trouble and now they have to make their subs exactly 12 inches long and that goes into the marketing question you know if you're going to promise to deliver something doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter how long you've been doing it if you don't deliver what you promise people are going to force you to deliver <laughs> what you promise um, and for me, that was just kind of interesting because Subway, number one grow, fastest growing franchise in the world for a long time, they knocked McDonald's off of that route. And for someone to come in and tell them, you're not doing this right, you need to follow through on your words, that's a pretty uh, incredible thing. Um, and on the HR side, treating your employees well. I cannot stress how important that is. The job that I had before I worked for Community Futures, I worked for General Electric. I worked for GE Capital. So GE, uh, most people know what General Electric is. They have, they're massive in manufacturing. A lot of people don't know that they used to have a capital division that was like the fifth largest bank in North America by assets. So they knew capital as well. They had a lot of employees in Canada and in the role that I was in, we did field audits. So we would drive around a bunch and do audits at different places. And in this particular role, the average time for someone to stay in that role was 15 to, I think it was 15 to 20 years for someone to stay in that same role without promotion. And the reason for that was because GE took such good care of their employees. The pay wasn't necessarily the best. I could have made it going somewhere else. You got a company car, not as great as it sounds. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into it. But some of the benefits that they gave you were absolutely phenomenal. One in particular was because I was a mobile employee, I didn't have a manager that I would report to, didn't have an office that I would go to, and they were really worried about the health of their employees. So I had a phone number I could call, pick up the phone, dial the number, and on the other end would be a doctor with about 20 years experience who would answer my questions and say, what's going on? Can't sleep? What's going on? What's your schedule like? Is this happening? Is that happening? Totally free of charge to all of their employees. And the same doctor uh, would email all the employees with health tips, and you could actually personally get them on the phone. And for that in any organization, uh, it is pretty phenomenal. And for a big organization, 
that's even unheard of, you know? A lot of big organizations sometimes, they don't necessarily care as much about the employees or you think they don't care as much. Uh, but when you do small things like that, I'm not saying go out and buy a doctor for your staff, uh, but talk to them and see what's important because GE looked at it and they said, our mobile staff, their health is important. How do we do that? So just a kind of a little takeaway I had from last week. The competition, what's your mantra? What is your mantra? April 21st at 2 p.m. I am so vehement about that. I'm probably going to break this pedestal by the time we're done. Um, I, I won't go too in-depth about this because I've talked to you guys to death about this. But remember that April 21st at 2 p.m. Okay? Now on to SWOT. So you guys, I know we talk a lot about marketing. We talk a lot about businesses. We've even had some mention of SWOT. So what is a SWOT analysis? Um, before I do that, does anybody know what SWOT stands for? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's it. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what is a SWOT? It's a planning tool. It's something that as an entrepreneur you can use to help plan the goals for your business. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? So you assess your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. So there, there's so many different ways that you can use a SWOT analysis. Um, there are a few wrong ways, <laughs> and we're going to go into some, some pitfalls that you can fall into. But as a general rule, this is a really good way for entrepreneurs to assess not only their business, but perhaps the market that you're in as well. Your competitors are a huge factor into your SWOT analysis. And for those of you that maybe haven't started on the full business plan yet, this can be a good place to start because there's a lot of information that goes into this that you can use to pull into the rest of your business plan as well. Um, but with that being said, this is a really difficult thing to do. Um, SWOT analysis is one of those things. It's like, <laughs> have you ever had the question, I'm Cheryl talked about it last week, what is your greatest weakness? People don't like that question in an interview and they'll always try and pick something that's actually a strength for them, right? The SWOT analysis to an extent is very similar and a lot of entrepreneurs can have trouble finding what the weak points in their business are, especially when they're doing it on their own. So the elements of a SWOT analysis. So this is typically how I do a SWOT analysis. Whenever I have someone in my office, I start with drawing a grid, <coughs> just a grid exactly like this and I write strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats on it. Now, there are a few key things for you guys to know about this part of the SWOT analysis um, that I typically point out as well. So strengths and weaknesses, those are internal. That is what is in your business that you can control, okay? We're gonna go into them in more detail as well. Um, and opportunities and threats are external. So those are things that are not in your business that you cannot typically control, okay? Strengths and opportunities, positive. Weaknesses and threats, typically negative and if you're if you find yourself you know doing a weakness like the whole interview thing like I care too I spend too much time looking after my clients I care too much it's not really going to give you any sort of uh, really good information in there um, so in, in terms of the internal factors these are the things that we're talking about when we're talking about the kinds of things you need to consider when you're first doing the SWOT analysis and you sit down so I sit down and I'm looking at my strengths it's essentially a list of resources for your company. It's human resources, physical resources, financial resources, the activities and processes that you have in place, and your past experiences as well. So when we're talking about your SWOT analysis, the human resources, for example, that's your staff, that's your volunteers, that's your board members, that's the people that are actually running your business. Uh, the physical resources, do you have a location? Do you have a building? Are you, let's go back to Abs and Youngland that came in. Uh, perhaps the strength is that you have a really great location because Addison Young helped you with your location analysis or you actually did a location analysis. Um, that talks about any equipment that you have as well. Equipment can be a huge strength um, if you know how to use it properly and, uh, and you can use it to reach uh, the kind of goals of what you want to get to your clients. Financial, I mean, pretty straightforward. The cash that you have, maybe you have some grants, funding agencies, people like Community Futures, people like the banks. What finances do you have to reach your goals um, and and the financial resources aspect now this is one of the ones that you can really quantify you can actually take a look and know this is the amount of debt I can take on in my business this is the amount of cash I assume to make you know this is the amount of cash I have in reserve in case something goes wrong that type of thing um, is in there as well activities and processes that's what you do 
we talked a lot about processes um, in this course. I think we've had three different presenters who have talked about processes. And it's really important to write down the way that you want things to happen in your business. That's what a process is, is you write down the steps of how you want something done. And that is as an entrepreneur so that you can leave. I once had an entrepreneur that said the most successful vacation he ever took is when he came back and the building hadn't burned down. <laughs> he didn't get a single phone call and that for him, he said it was a terrible vacation, but he counted it as a win because none of his staff called him to ask him how to do something. And that entire thing went back to the processes that he had in place. And when you're talking about, I know when we had MNP in, in the first week they talked about franchising. Franchising is a huge goal for a lot of businesses. And you, for those of you that have watched Dragon's Den, they talk about it all the time. Have you licensed? Are you gonna franchise? And that's where those processes come in handy as well. Past experiences. Don't shy away from using your past experiences and the past experiences of your employees as well. One of the more important parts of a business plan that we don't necessarily mention specifically in our training, but uh, it is a part of the plan itself, is who your management team is. And that goes to show who you have on your side, who's in your corner so that when things go bad, you can turn to them and talk to them. That's a strength. You know, um, if you don't have anyone that understands accounting or financing or, you know, it, it goes back to that whole conversation of technician, manager or entrepreneur, which one are you going to be, you know? Um, and so you want to make sure that you hire people who can be those technicians or can be those managers and build on their strengths as well. Any questions on those internal factors? All right, onto the external factors. These are your opportunities and your threats. These are the things where you really need to take a look at your competition and some things that you can take a look at are future trends. You can take a look at what's the economy doing. Take a look at what are the funding sources that are out there right now. Demographics, what's the physical environment, legislation. I'm, you know, these are such important things that you need to take a look at. And some of them you may not take a look at. You know, future trends, for example. I know a lot of entrepreneurs that don't look at the future trends, but there are a couple on there that are really important, the economy. The economy is a critically important factor when you're putting your business plan together because most of your businesses, you're after their disposable income. That We used to call it share of wallet. And if you want someone to open up their wallet to you, you really need to show them that there's a reason for that, especially when the economy goes bad. I mean, how many in this room know someone that was affected by the price of oil going down? Just by a show of hands. Less, actually a little bit less than I thought. And we're lucky because Lethbridge hasn't been as affected to this point as Calgary or Edmonton or Red Deer. That's not to say that we haven't been affected, but as an entrepreneur, especially when you're asking for that share of wallet, you need to understand what the implications of that are. Um, the funding sources, that can be a huge thing. Um, and it kind of ties a little bit into the economy. Anyone guess what happens uh, when the economy tanks? What happens to the banks? I think I'm broke. To hopefully not broke, but they don't want to lend anymore, right? They, they, they tighten their risk profile, right? Or they reassess their risk profile. They have a lot of words for it, but what it comes down to is they don't want to put money out in the economy that they don't think they're going to get paid back. Um, dirty little secret about finance, collateral, your house, the building, the equipment, no bank, no lender, no angel investor, no nobody wants that collateral. Nobody does. That is the very last thing that any lender ever wants to do is take that collateral from you because they're never gonna get the value that it's worth and it's a pain in the butt to take it and sell it. So you need to really take a look at those funding sources and see where the best options are. It may be grants. It may be through an uh, organization like Community Futures. It may be through the bank, but you need to understand those. And the same goes for demographics. We talked quite a bit last week about market research and about knowing who your market is. And that can go towards your opportunities and your threats as well. Um, legislation is another one that a lot of people forget. And again, a lot of you may not have any direct implication uh, when it comes to legislation, but there are some of you that the industries that you're wanting to go into, the government has their finger in there and the government sets the regulations for the industry. So if you don't understand what the regulations are, you're gonna potentially have a whole mess of problems when you actually start working and the government finds out that you're not following those legislations or you're not following those rules. Um, and the same goes with changing legislation. Legislation changes all the time. For those, any of you involved in agriculture, just by a show of hands? No? Anyone know what happened to the egg industry very recently in terms of legislation? What was that, sorry? 
Yeah, exactly. Now, for those of you that don't know, that means that employees on farms now have essentially workers' comp benefits, and they have benefits that typically farmers didn't extend to their employees. Um, ask a normal, not normal, ask a, a regular person who doesn't work in, in the farming industry, and what are they going to say? My, <laughs> everyone should have workers' comp benefits, right? Ask a farmer, totally different ballgame. My brother-in-law's a farmer, and he won't shut up about it. Um, I don't, <laughs> you know, and that's just the, I don't necessarily understand the implications that it has, but that's something that you as entrepreneurs need to understand how it affects your business. Any questions on those external factors? All right. Now, how do you build a SWOT? So, the number one thing that I can say, and, and probably the first piece of advice that I give people when they're talking about building a SWOT analysis is don't do it alone. Um, you know, especially if you're planning on doing the whole business plan by yourself, you need to make sure that you have a lot of different viewpoints when it comes to your business. And it, it all comes back to that tunnel vision. Um, so many times when I see entrepreneurs working on their business and passionate about their business and living in their business, they get that tunnel vision and they're like, well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. There's nothing wrong with my business. I have great prices. I have great products. It's your, it's your child. You don't necessarily know what's wrong with it or you can't be truly objective with what may be the weaknesses involved in there so one of the things that i always recommend is talk to your stakeholders do you have someone that you're working with as an advisor do you have people that have invested in your business if you have family that's invested some money in your business people that you've talked to about your business idea bring them into that process and you see that one big word on there brainstorm brainstorming is so important to do in something like a SWOT analysis because if you just put what your initial thoughts are and then just leave it, then you might as well not even done the SWOT analysis to begin with. Because you're essentially going to get out of the SWOT analysis what you put into it. Um, sometimes more input is better. Um, you, there's not necessarily any wrong answers and there's nothing to say that you can't take ideas out of there. But especially when you're brainstorming, and we'll go through the steps of brainstorming as well and the do's and don'ts, is that you never tell someone that their idea is stupid. <laughs> when you're going through to do it. You want to get as many ideas on paper initially as you can and then weed it down from there. Um, research secondary sources. I quiz from last week, what's a secondary source? Anybody remember? <coughs> yeah? Pre-done uh, market research such as surveys and focus groups. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, you look at a secondary source like um, you could go to Stats Canada. You could look at Economic Development Leftbridge. You could take a look at what's already in the marketplace for that research. Keep in mind that when you're pulling secondary research, you want to check the sources. You want to check the date of it because you don't want to pull secondary research that was from Montreal 10 years ago, you know, and it just says demographics of retail purchasing. So you really want to make sure that you understand where that information is coming from as well. Uh, if you're already in business, Craig Elias said it in our very first session, talk to your clients. And not only why did you choose to buy from me, uh, but are you satisfied? And do the focus group through them. What brought you to me to begin with? You know, What strength did you see that brought you into my business? Um, and then when you're all done it, write a summary. Write it down on paper. Get it in some tangible way that it makes sense to you, and it makes sense to people who are reading it as well. Um, they're, they're, like I said, in this process, the most important thing is that you get as much information as possible when you're, uh, when you're putting it all together. The other thing that, I, I, and it's a pitfall, and I, I don't think I actually included it in the pitfall section, but I see it all the time, is don't put information in a SWOT unless you know that it's true. I've had a lot of people who have come to me and they say, when they're doing a SWOT analysis, they'll include their competitors. And they'll say, well, competitor X doesn't spend any money on marketing, or not as much as I plan to spend on marketing. And my first question is, well, did you work for company X? Because if not, and you don't know what their marketing budget is, you can't just assume how much they spend. You can't use that as a basis for your strategy if you're just pulling information out of nowhere and you're just assuming. There is some level of assumption built in to any sort of analysis like this, but when it's such specific information like that, you can't assume anything. Um, so you have it built. Great. I have a SWOT analysis. It's sitting in front of me. I have it all written down. What do I do? That's where you really start to build your plan. That's where you take a look at it and you start to leverage your opportunities and your strengths 
how can I use my strengths to get my opportunities? You can do threats, uh, threat strength strategies. How do you use your strength to overcome threats to you? Um, how do you use your opportunities to overcome weakness? Essentially, when you draw that SWOT out, you draw an arrow from each section to the other section, and they are going to in some way line up, and you can use this to build your strategic plan, okay? Um, and the thing about this as well is there's a lot of people that um, go in and they build the SWOT analysis, and then they never look at it again. And I, you know, a lot of people have that reaction to the SWOT analysis and the business plan. Um, my recommendation is always don't let both of them fall by the wayside. The SWOT analysis especially can be a really helpful tool when three years down the road you've reached your goals, you want to know what you need to do yet next. Is it that you're going to sell your business? Is it that you want to expand? Is it that you want to capture more market share? Do you want a new product line? What is it that you want to do? That's where the SWOT analysis can come in because you can leverage those strengths to, to meet all of your opportunities as well. Um, I think that uh, probably one of the other pitfalls that people fall a little bit into is that they'll put down, especially when they're doing it for the purpose of something like the CEC or for the purpose of coming to me to ask for money, a lot of people fall into the trap of writing down what they think the other person wants to read. And that can be a really dangerous kind of thing to play with because essentially if you come to me for a loan, you give me your business plan, you give me your, your cash flow, you give me everything that you need, my job is to make sure that that's right. And so someone in my role will tear apart your business plan. And if you put information in there that isn't true or you've assumed or isn't accurate, they will call you on it. And they want a reason for why you put that information in there. And that's why, again, it is so critical to be as transparent as possible when doing the SWOT analysis and not putting in things that don't really belong in there. So when we're talking about planning, planning is a difficult thing to do. It's not good enough just to say, I'm going to go out and do this. I'm going to grab X. I'm going to go and do this. You need to put in how you plan on doing that. Um, a lot of people will just say, like I said, my plan is to go and increase sales. That's not really an action plan. You need to talk about what are the milestones that you want to hit. Is it, does it have to do with your traffic count? Does it have to do with the number of clients contacted? Does it have to do with the number of uh, quotes that you give in a week? What are those milestones that you want to hit that are going to lead to that action plan taking place? Uh, who's responsible for it? Um, how many of you are actually going to have employees or other people that are running the business with you? A few of you? Hold them accountable. Hold yourself accountable. You are your own employee, and a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs will get stuck in that mindset of, well, I'll do it later maybe, or I have something else I need to focus on right now. So when you have a plan that you put in place and you say, I need to accomplish X by this date, make sure you hold yourself accountable to that, and same with your employees as well. Um, and, and the next thing, the timeline. You need to give yourself a timeline when you're talking about setting your goals. Um, it, it's not good enough to say, I'm going to increase sales by 20%. Well, well, you know, over 20 years, by inflation alone, you're set. Your sales are increased, right? You don't need to worry about it. Um, that is so that you guys can really truly evaluate whether or not you've met those goals. And we are going to go into a little bit about how to set those goals as well uh, in the next slide. Um, and you want to write down what are some of the challenges that are facing you. Uh, can any of you guess where you pull those challenges from? The SWAT! <laughs> exactly. So the challenges could be the threats, you know, that you have to overcome. It even could be the weaknesses. But how are you going to do it? And again, that's another thing where you get as many of those stakeholders as possible that are going to talk to you and be honest with you about it. Because typically, when you have that group mentality, um, it's a lot easier to come up with ideas. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that I personally, when I was in school, if I had a project that was just me, the number of times that I'd bang my head against the wall trying to come up with something by myself. And for those of you that have worked in groups before, it can be a whole lot easier when you have someone else to bounce those ideas off of and be your sounding board. Um, and make sure that you come with solutions. That's the other biggest thing is don't just write down the problem. Have something that might approach the fix to it. So in terms of the objectives, has anyone ever heard of SMART goal setting? 
Yeah, a couple of you, I see some hands raising. The same principle applies to action planning and objective setting. So these are your SMART objectives. So they need to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. Those are so critically important because when you're setting yourself goals and objectives, especially for your business, the last thing that you want to have happen is that you go and set a goal and it's not specific. That's where we're talking about, well, I'm going to increase sales. Well, what does that even mean? You know, what, is, what does that even mean in terms of, of your business? It needs to be measurable. So if you just say that uh, you want to see increased customer satisfaction, I want people to be happier. That's not tangible. How do you measure that? You know, unless, you're, unless you are an economist and you understand really obscure um, economic <laughs> theories and can study graphs. I mean, economists try and study how happy people are, but it's not really measurable for you guys. Um, something that you can achieve. So don't set yourself the moon, you know? If you think, for example, that you can increase your sales by 20%, that's specific, that's measurable. Is it achievable? Maybe. Um, is it realistic? You know, 100% sales, for example, may be achievable, but it's not really realistic for what you're going to be doing. And this especially ties into the SWOT analysis. And once you guys know what your weaknesses, especially your weaknesses and your threats are, that will help you um, determine whether or not they're actually realistic for yourselves. And the last thing is time bound. Like I said before, if you say you want a 20% increase in sales with no time limit on there, assuming your business stays in business and does the same amount roughly, then you're eventually going to hit that just by inflation alone. So you need to make sure that if your goal is I want to increase my sales of, let's say I'm a landscaper. So I want to I wanna increase my sales for my lawn care um, specifically by 20% by the end of next business year. That's a smart goal. It's specific, you can actually measure it, it's bound by time, and it's actually achievable. And you need to make sure that you're the one. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of SWOT analysis where achievable is interchangeable with actionable. And what that means really is you are able to do something that will help to reach that goal. So whether it's maybe you give new customers a 10% discount, that means that it's actionable on your part to be able to achieve that goal. Make sense? Any questions about smart goal setting? So um, your objectives, you would put that in your summary, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you do put something like this in your business plan, you could have a separate, separate section. I've seen people put it in their executive summary. I've seen people include it in their SWOT, and they put in their SWOT analysis. They put in, essentially, they do that cross grid that I showed you guys. They write down the information that they have in there, and then right below it, they say, essentially, an interpretation. And they say, these are my strength, opportunity, leveraged objectives that I want to meet. These are my uh, strength, threat uh, objectives that I want to meet, that type of thing. And you know what, there's nothing wrong with putting this right in your business plan and measuring it and saying, okay, this goal is specific because such and such, measurable because such and such. Could you repeat what you said about actionable and achievable? Please? Yeah, so actionable and achievable, essentially what that means is you need to be able to act to make that goal work. So it needs to be from an effort that you or an employee makes. You can't leave it open to the will of the economy or the free hand of the economy. It needs to be something that you physically or can actually go and do for your business. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So the, the strategy, mm -hmm. okay, and the objectives, they're pretty close. Like yeah, one feeds off the other. Exactly. Right? It all is essentially a continuum. I've had some people that have told me that the best way that they ever tell an entrepreneur to make a business plan, start with the SWOT analysis and it all flows from there. Um, you're going to have, I mean, for as many people as we have in here that are telling you different aspects of a business, you're going to have different people telling you different ways to start a business. So should you start, like, should you start your, before you do your strategy, should you have a, a basic idea of your objectives, or wh when you do your strategies, is your are your objectives gonna kind of well, come clear? Like that's what I would say. Yeah, is you take a look at your SWOT analysis and you say, okay, I'm gonna use. I see that this is a strength. Say is my my people, my sales force. I have a really dynamic sales team. Has a lot of experience. And right. And you base it off of your or from that, then you could 
set some objectives. Exactly, and then you say as an opportunity, for example, I know that there's a huge uh, potential for the, I know that this demographic specifically exists and I want to go after it. So then all of a sudden your objective becomes you use that, you leverage that sales force in order to accomplish that, uh, that, uh, that opportunity or in order to uh, get that objective. Make sense? Perfect. Um, any other questions on anything we've covered so far? Let's talk about the pitfalls. <coughs> These are the things that people do wrong when they're doing a SWOT analysis. Um, SWOT analysis, you'll have some people that will tell you SWOT analysis is the easiest thing in the world to do. You just throw some words on paper and you're golden. Um, not necessarily true. Uh, it can sometimes be really easy to do initially, but it's really important to go deeper, to go and be a little bit more creative, whether that means that you do it in a second round. You, I mean, a lot of people say, I'll just sit, do a SWOT in 10 minutes and I'm done. Um, may not be the best SWOT in the world. You really need to revisit it. Um, the, give it that sober second thought. That's something that they talk a lot about, especially when I was in my, my finance degree. They talked about walking away from an, a loan application and at the bank, hugely they talked about that. You finish a loan application, you walk away from it, you come back when your mind's clear and you give it a sober second thought like you're reading it for the first time. Do the same thing with your SWOT analysis. Take a break after you've written it Maybe a couple days, go play a video game, go do something else to take your mind completely off of it, and then revisit it. Does it still make sense to you? Is it still something that you can see for your business? Is it still something that you think you can achieve? Is it still accurate to, say, the opportunities and threats? Is that still accurate? Did you learn any new information? Is something new coming to mind? Um, a lot of people as well, they don't follow the rules of brainstorming. Uh, we're gonna go through the rules of brainstorming next so that you guys know what they are. Um, making decisions on too little information. Uh, the one story that I'll tell you guys, it was the same client that I had who said, well, he doesn't spend as much on marketing as I plan on spending on marketing, so I'm golden, right? I'll be able to capture 50% market share, no problem. He ended up, unfortunately, getting finance from somewhere else, but when he came back, it turned out he had too little information. Company X did not, in fact, spend too little on marketing. They simply looked at marketing in a different way and they were already in the customer mind. And it was very similar to when Craig Elias was speaking on the first day, where you want to get to people before the decision to purchase has been made. That's essentially what Company X was doing. So when this person went out to a trade show, say, they didn't see any marketing by Company X because Company X was already on a commercial, you know, for, or a YouTube commercial for the clients when they were looking at something else entirely. So it turned out that Company X actually spent quite a bit on marketing it was just directed in a different way that this particular entrepreneur didn't know. Um, and lack of candor. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with the people that are doing it. Be honest to your business. There's a lot of people, like I said, that will put down what they think we want to hear or what they think that sounds right. And that is the, the absolute wrong thing to do. You need to be completely honest in this or it's not worth the paper that it's written on. So let's talk a little bit about brainstorming rules. These are the brainstorming rules. It's pretty basic stuff, and I feel like sometimes when I go through this, it's kind of like I'm talking to a kindergarten class. <laughs> you know, don't make people feel dumb. If especially, and that's I, I think that this one should be at the absolute top. Um, is that you do you defer judgment because that is the number one thing that is going to kill brainstorming. If you go and you sit down, you bring all these people in. And you say, great, anybody got an idea? And they tell you the idea, and you go, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I don't even know why you're here. What are the odds that they're going to say anything else for the rest of the time that you're there? Pretty low? I know for me, I probably would say, oh, screw you then. I'm going to go get a coffee. I don't want to be here to help you. So that's a really important thing, um, one idea at a time. That means that you don't want to have 100 different people yelling ideas at you. You need to be able to process them separately and build on those other ideas. You need to encourage those wild ideas too. Some of the best, I mean, I don't have specific examples, I'm sure that both of these guys do, but some of the best ideas in marketing come from wild ideas. <laughs> I mean, I, show, I told you guys that, five, that, I think it was that $10 million Super Bowl commercial that we saw, that was the wiener dogs running across the open field towards the Heinz and the dancing Heinz and uh, ketchup and mustard. You gotta know that that was a wild idea when it first came out, you know? But they went with it and it worked. Um, go for quantity. You want those ideas. You want to get as many down on paper as you can. There's nothing that says that you can't take ideas out. 
But it's really difficult when you're at crunch time and you can't add no, more ideas in. It's a really hard thing to do. Be visual. Write it down. <laughs> you know, uh, put a thought web out, write it on a board, do something so that visually you and the people you're working with can see what it is that you're doing. Um, headline, all that means is that you essentially go in with an idea, a rough idea of what it is that you want to do. So on the purpose of this, your headline would be SWOT analysis. You would make sure people would understand what a SWOT is and kind of direct their focus that way. Um, building on ideas. I mean, how many of you have seen, I know, I, I, don't, I think it was from Friends or, no, The Office. I love The Office. And one of my favorite scenes is when uh, Michael Scott goes and he's in his, uh, what's it called? Uh, whose line is it anyway? They do it. It's, uh, I told you blanking on it. What's it called? Improv. improv. Thank you. He goes to his improv class. And they say, what do you need to do? You need to say yes and. So always add to it. And it's the exact same thing with brainstorming. Think of brainstorming like improv. If someone says something, say yes and build on it. Uh, don't do the same thing Michael Scott did. I, I remember it so vividly with uh, Michael Scorn, and he would always have a gun. <laughs> and the people would always put their hands up. So don't be that person. Uh, defer judgment, like I said, that's number one on my list. Because if you are going to be a very detrimental to that creative process, and it is a process, then there's no point in you doing the SWOT analysis to begin with. And then you go through it. You go through, you mark the good ideas, the bad ideas, whether you do it yourself, that's fine. And you take out what you like and don't like. And that is brainstorming in a nutshell. Um, do you guys have any questions on the brainstorming aspect? I mean, a SWOT analysis is, it's a pretty basic tool, you know. There's a lot of ways to use it properly, and there's a lot of ways to use it improperly. Um, don't spend a crazy amount of time. Don't make yourselves go crazy over this. There's a lot of answers in a SWOT analysis, and you're not going to necessarily have all of the answers off the bat, okay? So take your time with a SWOT analysis. Use the people around you, use your stakeholders. You can even use, I know a few of you, if you have people that you've already talked to to do a little bit of market research, use those same people when you're doing your SWOT analysis. People that you can trust to be honest, people that you can trust to give you good ideas as well. Uh, but even if they don't, don't call them out on it because they're just there to help you guys out. Um, is there any questions on SWOT analysis at all? All right. Well, what we're going to do then, we're about quarter after seven, so we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to jump over to Trent and Brian here. So let's be back in, let's give it 10 minutes. So at about uh, 7.25, you guys come back, and we'll be ready to go.